This video is going to get you through the illness chapter, which is chapter 16 or 17, depending on which edition of the textbook you have. And the more recent versions from 7th on up, it is in chapter, um, got to look again. It's in chapter 16, but if you have the older editions, it's in chapter 17. Um, starting us out, we're going to do important people yet again. And so Robert Cope, we've talked about him before. He is the person who helped develop the auger that we use in both slants and plates so that we can grow organisms. Um, his relevance for this particular chapter right here is he helped come up with a germ theory of the di uh, disease by developing some postulates that he thought were essentially steps that you have to go through in order to verify that a particular illness is caused by a particular pathogen. Um, as you look at the picture off and down the side, so he was working with Bacillus anthracis, which is the causative agent for anthrax. What he said first was that if you have people that all have, or mice in his case, uh, that all have the same symptoms, you have to be able to pull out the same organism from all of the organisms that have those symptoms. And so in the case of anthrax, any mouse that looked like it had anthrax, he had to be able to pull out that species and then view it under the microscope. And that species had to not be present in healthy people. So that was helping to prove that this organism is probably what made those people or mice sick. Once he did that, he had to be able to grow that organism in pure culture in the lab. So remember, pure culture is just one species. That can be difficult to do with some organisms and impossible for some, but that was his step two. From there, things got extra messy. You can't do this next one with human hosts, but you can do it with animal models. You would have to take the purified organism that you grew in the lab and inject it into a healthy host, and then they must develop the same symptoms that the original, in this case, mouse, developed up here. And then you had to be able to re-isolate from the one that you got sick. So he was essentially showing that Bacillus anthracis is the bacteria that causes the disease that is anthrax. And so it was present in every mouse that had the illness. If you purified it and re-injected it, you could make a healthy mouse sick. Um, and so that's what he was doing here in this particular chapter. Next up, pathogen. I want to say we have defined this once before, but these are microbes that cause disease. Um, they don't necessarily have to be microbes, but usually they are. Um, the way your book defines that is they're microbes that can damage the human body, but if you're damaging the body, there's going to be a disease process at play. One of the things that's important about this is there are different things that are pathogenic to different people. There are a lot of people out there who are immunocompromised because if they have something like cancer, we have to shut down their immune system so that we can treat the cancer essentially. And so all people who are going through different forms of cancer treatment tend to be immunocompromised. There are people who have genetic illnesses like SCID, severe combined immunodeficiency. They're immunocompromised because of a bad gene that they have. And so even something that doesn't make a normal host sick can become pathogenic in people who are immunocompromised. Um, next up, are all bacteria germs? And I put germs in quote because there's not really a defined definition for germs. Um, germs essentially is going to mean pathogens, and we should already know the answer to this. No, not all bacteria are germs. Remember, you have a normal flora. That normal flora of bacteria that lives inside of you is actually helpful. They don't cause disease in a normal, healthy person. Next, um, I did give you a little note that if you don't remember how the immune system works really well, you should go back and study that from either your AMP textbook or your freshman bio textbook. The Nestor textbook does have a, a chapter or two that covers the immune system, but just really quickly, you need to remember that the immune system has two branches, specific and nonspecific, aka um, adaptive and innate immunity. Um, your nonspecific defenses basically include your surface barriers so that things can't get into your body to cause disease to begin with. If they do get in, we've got inflammation and phagocytosis that are going to try to clear the infection regardless of what that infection happens to be. Adaptive immunity works entirely differently. Adaptive is also called specific. There you have lymphocytes, either B lymphocytes or T lymphocytes that are going to help you clear specific infections. Like you have an army of T lymphocytes that can fight E. coli that are completely useless against, against salmonella because those are different species. And so that's why it's also called the specific immune system. Um, the adaptive immune system has two branches as well, humoral and cellular. Humoral immunity uses B cells that are going to secrete antibodies that can help to neutralize pathogens or toxins secreted by pathogens. And then cellular immunity uses T cells to kill virus infected cells or cancer cells or things like that. 
you have to remember how this system is supposed to work because this is what we're going to be trying to talk about as we go through the illness chapter. It's going to come into play. So please refresh yourself if you don't remember a lot of this. Um, this is just showing you specific immunity in a little bit more detail. Remember I said there's humoral, which uses B cells. It secretes antibodies and cellular, also called cell mediated. They use T cells that can become cytotoxic, which is they release poisons that kill virus infected cells or cancerous cells. Memory cells are long lived. The first time you're exposed, you get a primary immune response. The second time you're exposed, you do a secondary immune response, which is faster and stronger than the primary immune response. All right. Um, up next come some terms from freshman bio. They don't usually cover these terms in AMP, but a symbiotic relationship is a relationship where two organisms are interacting together. A lot of students have a misconception that symbiosis is a mutualistic relationship where everybody wins, and it's very important that you understand that's not true. Symbiotic relationships can include pathogenic relationships, herbivorous relationships, predator-prey relationships, um, commensal relationships. Symbiotic just means two organisms are interactive. Now, mutualism is a type of symbiotic relationship, but it's only just one type. Um, now, since I used the word mutualistic a second ago, mutualism means that both partners benefit. So, in the case of this picture that I'm showing you right here, this bird is cleaning things off the teeth of this, I can't tell with mouths open, I think it's a crocodile, but who knows, whatever, maybe it's a caiman, I got no idea. Um, but it's cleaning the teeth off, so it's getting some bugs from the mouth of the crocodile, and at the same time the crocodile is getting its teeth clean from a bird, so everybody is winning in this case. Even when the crocodile is not eating the bird, everybody is winning. Um, different example of a symbiotic relationship in terms of microorganisms would be you and your normal flora. You're giving them a place to live and you're giving them nutrients and at the same time they're breaking down those nutrients and giving you vitamins and helping to prime your immune system. So you and your normal flora have a mutualistic relationship where everybody is benefiting. Now, a commensal relationship is one where one organism benefits, but the other one doesn't gain or lose anything. It's just kind of there. The example in this little gift that I've got going on is barnacles living on a whale. They get a house, but it doesn't hurt the whale. It also doesn't help the whale, so they just have a place to live and the whale doesn't win or lose. There are some organisms that are living on you where you're providing them with housing and they're not giving you anything in return, and so some of the organisms that are living on you do fall into that category. Uh, parasitic relationships, this is where something is deriving nutrients from living on the surface of an organism, and so this could be like fleas or ticks are examples of parasites. Um, let's see, in terms of microorganisms, pathogenic organisms are the most similar to parasitic organisms. Um, let's see, I won't go into that one. We already did those terms. There's just a fun little tick for you, have fun. All right, normal microbiota. Um, again, I tend to call this normal flora because this is what I was taught back when I was going through school. This is the picture from your textbook that shows you the different species that you have living in different places. It is very important that you understand everybody's different. Um, so most people are going to have staph epidermidis growing on their skin, but it's possible that you find a person out there that doesn't have that. It would be rare, but you could in theory find a person who doesn't have that. Same with any of these other ones. Now, the large intestine there's hundreds of species in there. There's only like 12 or so listed up over here. So again, there's important things that aren't listed on this. One of the things that's important for you guys to understand, especially about the organisms that live in your gut, they can metabolize drugs and make drugs work really well in some people, but in people who don't have that same organism that don't metabolize that drug, that drug is useless for that person. And so the normal microbiota also plays a role in which drugs work for which people because, again, everybody's is different. No two people on the planet have the exact same, uh, exact same microbiome. Even between a mother and a child, they're going to be very different from each other. That said, I did want you to learn some of the ones that tend to be more common in a higher percentage of the population. So what I want you to know is, for the skin of a healthy individual, you're going to tend to find the Staph epi that we've been playing with in lab this whole time. Most people tend to have Propionibacterium acnes, which has been implicated in acne. However, not everybody gets acne that has the bacteria. There's a hormonal and an oil issue that goes along with that too. We'll come back to that when we start talking about skin infections later. Um, I also do want you to focus on what's going on in the large intestine. Again, there's lots of species that are going on over here. We've been playing with E. coli in the lab all along. Proteus uh, mirabilis was one of the species that could reduce sulfur that we saw in um, the sim medium. 
I don't think we've played with Klebsiella. Lactobacillus is considered a probiotic and that's because it lives in your gut and you can find it in yogurt and things like that. Uh, there are strep species that live in there. Now Canada albicans is actually a yeast, not a bacterial species, but yeast is still a microbe. Um, it's just a fungus, not a bacterium. We've been playing with some Pseudomonas and then we've played with Enterococcus uh, fecalis in the lab as well. And so those are the ones that you tend to find in healthy individuals. Mm. Next up, um, how does normal microbiota help you keep out pathogens? One, essentially, they've already filled the apartments on your body, and once your apartment's filled, uh, filled, pathogens don't have a chance to come in. The way your book describes that is they're covering the binding site so that pathogens can't attach. So you're already occupied, nobody else can move in. Um, two, they're consuming some nutrients and then out-competing pathogens that would like to consume that nutrient, but they can't because your normal flora has already eaten it for you. So competition is at play and hopefully your normal microbiota uh, is winning that competition. And then three, some of the organisms that live in or on you, they can produce antimicrobials that can kill off pathogens that are trying to get in or on you. And so essentially we've got some chemical warfare happening between the microbiota and then pathogens that are trying to move on to you. Um, hygiene hypothesis. This is a very interesting um, idea that is out there and we have noticed that since the advent of antibiotics, and our desire to keep ourselves and our children cleaner, we have started to see an increase in allergic diseases, autoimmune diseases, um, things like asthma and eczema, those are on the increase. So the hypothesis is that the reason that we're seeing an increase in those diseases, which all of those diseases mean that your immune system is becoming hyperactive, it's becoming more active than it is supposed to be. Um, essentially what we think is happening is because you're not exposing yourself to pathogens, your immune system's kind of getting bored in the background and so it's decided, screw it, we're just going to start dive bombing healthy tissues because we've got nothing else to do. And so if they start dive bombing the airway of the lungs, you get asthma. If they start attacking the skin, you get eczema or some other form of dermatitis. And so what we're trying to teach people to do is one, don't take antibiotics unless you absolutely need to have them, especially in younger children. There is a direct correlation between providing a child antibiotics prior to the second birthday and the prevalence of asthma later in their lives. Um, so don't take antibiotics unless you absolutely need them. But two, don't keep your kids so clean that their immune system never gets to meet pathogens. Because if they don't meet pathogens, again, your immune system starts to get bored and it attacks things that it shouldn't be attacking. Um, I kind of, I was the person who kept the, her kid entirely too clean because little boys stink if you don't keep them too clean. Um, and so he would have to take his shower and bath every single day. And he did end up developing both asthma and allergies later in his life. Um, if I had allowed him to go outside and play more and maybe eat some dirt, uh, he might have gotten sick a little bit more often as a kid, but he wouldn't have gone over towards the allergy asthma side in theory. And so essentially what I'm saying is let your kid go outside and get dirty and play in a mud puddle with your dog. Only if they get truly, really sick should they go and get medical treatment for those things. Mm. Um, this is kind of just hitting that fact again. This is a story um, from Canada, but it still hits that point home. Now I will say there's this trend in the US where we're doing mud runs and the mud is dirty enough that people have come out of those mud runs with point source infections that they collected from said mud run. So don't, don't inhale a bunch of that sort of stuff because it can make you sick, especially if your immune system doesn't know how to deal with that stuff. But if their kids, their immune systems are actually really strong just, I don't know, you've got to, it's really, it's a hard balance that you have to meet between letting your kid meet their pathogens and getting sick and getting better and priming the immune system, but not so little that their immune system starts to become hyperactive and not infrequently enough that their immune system doesn't know how to deal with any of that sort of stuff. And so good luck finding that balance with your own kids. It's a very tough thing to try to hit the the homeostasis of your immune system essentially um kind of said this one earlier is it the same in all people no everybody's a little bit differently um there's an interesting correlation that has popped up in some studies on differences between babies that are born vaginally versus babies that are born through c-section 
Um, babies born through C-section tend to have increased risk of developing obesity later in adulthood and developing those autoimmune diseases that I was describing just a little bit ago. Um, it is believed to be that because when a baby passes through um, a healthy vagina during a vaginal birth, they are exposed to a bunch of lactic acid bacteria that live normally in the vagina. And as the baby comes through, it gets in the mouth, it gets into the digestive system. Um, interestingly, human beings add some oligosaccharides to milk that humans can't actually digest. So we're eating on purpose trying to feed that lactic acid bacteria in the baby so that it can develop a good normal microbiota like it's supposed to. If a baby is born through C-section though, they're not exposed to that bacteria. Instead, they're exposed to the bacteria on the skin as they're born, that Staph epi and Propionibacterium that we mentioned earlier. That bacteria doesn't get fed from the oligosaccharides in breast milk and the normal microbiota doesn't develop as normal in babies that are born through C-section. Now, it does eventually help to equalize, but apparently not soon enough that they don't end up with higher risk of developing, again, obesity, um, metabolic disorders, and what else did I say a second ago? I don't even remember what I said. I think asthma was the other one that I said. And so even going back to the moment of birth, problems can develop depending on how you get seeded with the different microorganisms. All right, um, colonization versus infection. Colonization means that you've got bacteria living on or in you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have an infection because again, your microbiota colonizes you. If something colonizes you that is not supposed to be on you and it is a pathogen, then that can lead to infection, which is colonization with a parasite or pathogen. Um, this person has just been debreeded. They have necrotizing fasciitis, which is a side effect or complication that can develop from certain staph and strep infections. The bacteria produces a compound called exfoliatin that essentially makes your skin sort of melt off your body. And so that's a pathogenic colonization that led to infection. Subclinical infection means that you have an infection, you could be spreading the infection, but you show no signs or symptoms. Um, you can Google Typhoid Mary. She was a real person. Um, she, was, she was an interesting person. So she was cooking in various households and the people in the household she was cooking in kept getting sick with typhoid fever, which is a foodborne illness. Um, as she would realize people were getting sick in her household, she would move to a different household and make that household sick. And so she, she realized that she was doing some things wrong. Well, some people tracked her down, realized that she had this subclinical infection, but that she was contaminating other people and they locked her up. Um, she was not a super willing patient. She in fact attacked some of the doctors with some serving forks, like those big turkey forks that you would use to carve up a turkey. Uh, she tried to attack a doctor with that. She did not want to stay locked up. They released her. She went right back to cooking in hospitals, making people sick. People would even joke that, ha ha, we think you're Typhoid Mary, but she had changed her name. So uh, they didn't know she really was Typhoid Mary. So then they locked her up and they didn't release her after the second time. Um, so the story of Typhoid Mary is of a person who had a subclinical infection, but kept contaminating other people and killing them. Um, let's see, infectious disease is an infection that does result in disease. Um, signs and symptoms, the, it's a very important distinction between those two things. Signs are objective things that a healthcare worker can measure and write in a chart. Something like there's a fever or blood pressure is higher or there's a lesion on the skin that measures three centimeters, whatever. But a sign is something that is measurable, objective, observable by another person. A symptom, on the other hand, is a subjective thing that the patient feels like, I feel hot or cold, I feel like my head hurts. It's subjective, it's definitely something the patient is still feeling and it matters, but it's not something that's measurable and so it's not weighted the same as a sign is, since a sign is something that is measurable and observable. Um, a primary infection is an initial infection that a person can get from a primary pathogen, like this person has tetanus. We don't see it all that often, although there have been more cases of it because of dumb people who aren't vaccinating. Tetanus is no joke. It makes your muscles contract so hard it will break the bones in your body. So don't play around with tetanus ever. If you think that you have stepped on a rusty nail, just go get your tetanus shot again and hope that you're good. Uh, that's a shot that you should be getting every 10 years. So if you haven't gotten a tetanus booster within the last 10 years, it's probably time for you to go visit your doctor and get one. 
Secondary infection is something that sort of rides on the coattails of the primary. You already had an illness, like flu, and then, well, pneumonia comes in and it's like, hey, you're already not feeling well, let me go ahead and give you pneumonia on top of your flu. And in fact, pneumonia is one of the leading causes of death in people who have flu because it's coming in and it's riding the coattails of flu and making you extra sick. And so people end up dying from that. Mm -hmm. Um, a primary pathogen is a pathogen that can cause disease in an otherwise healthy individual. So again, tetanus, chicken pox, those are primary pathogens. An opportunistic pathogen is one that can make a healthy person, pardon me, sick, but it can make a person who's immunocompromised sick. It can make a person who has something else going on sick, like they were already, they had a primary illness. The opportunistic pathogen can come in and cause an illness. So this person, they have diabetes. Um, people who have diabetes often have a neuropathy and so they can't feel their feet very well and so they are very commonly going to have wounds on their feet. That wound is a breeding ground for bacteria. So while Pseudomonas can't cause infection in a normal healthy person, for a diabetic who has a wound on their foot and can't feel it, Pseudomonas can come in here and cause a raging infection in that wound. Burn victims are another one. And Pseudomonas is one that loves burned skin. There's something about burned skin that provides all the nutrients that Pseudomonas needs and it will grow very well on there. And so you have to treat those people that have these underlying conditions a little bit differently than you would an otherwise healthy person because they are more likely to get opportunistic infections. Virulence essentially describes how ill a particular pathogen can make you or how likely it is that it can make an otherwise healthy person sick. Like E. coli, normal E. coli has very low virulence. It lives in everybody's intestines and everything is okay. But that strain of E. coli, the O157H7 that makes the Shiga toxin, it has much higher virulence and can make an otherwise healthy person very sick. So different strains can have different virulence levels. Um, a communicable disease is a contagious disease. It's something that can be spread from one person to another or from like a dog to a person or whatever. Smallpox was one of the very common communicable diseases. We did wipe that out back in the 1970s, but that's what this picture is attempting to show you. Um, infectious dose is the number of microbes necessary to actually establish an infection. Here's how I'm going to relate to this one. Let's talk about COVID. So let's say that you are sitting in a room with a person who has COVID and you're just watching TV. Nobody's talking to anybody. You're just watching what's on the TV. Well, you might have breathed in a couple of virions from COVID, but just a couple is not going to be enough for you to get sick because again, you have an immune system designed to help deal with stuff like that. But if you're a healthcare worker who is dealing all day, every day with people who have COVID and they are coughing all over the place and you're in rooms that have breathing treatments going that's aerosolizing the virus, you are inhaling millions of virions during the course of a day, you're much more likely to get sick from that. And so this is the, the saying is the dose makes the poison. You drink your eight glasses of water a day, which PS, there's no evidence that a person actually needs exactly eight glasses of water a day, but that's beside the point. Anyway, you drink eight glasses of water a day, you're gonna be fine. Go drink four gallons of water during the day and you're probably gonna die from hypoton uh, hypotonic hydration. And so even water can kill you. Same thing here, breathe in a couple of something and you're probably gonna be okay. Breathe in a lot of something and you will not be okay anymore. So the dose makes the poison. Incubation period is the time between when you breathed in or drank in or were exposed to the pathogen and when symptoms actually started to develop in you. Um, the period of illness is when you're actively uh, showing symptoms and signs. And so you're experiencing, you know, your whole, oh, I feel kind of tired and my head hurts and uh, I've had this cough. And when you go in, they can measure that you have a fever and you're, you have a productive cough and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the prodromal phase is the very early part of an illness where you're starting to realize, I don't feel awesome, but you're not really sure what's going to happen. Is it just your allergies are acting up or are you about to develop a COVID infection? Prodromal phase is very vague. And again, symptoms tend to be, I don't feel so good. Uh, malaise, which is I'm just kind of tired and I don't want to do anything and I have a headache. Mm. Um, the convalescence phase is the end where you're starting to recuperate after the period of illness. Now, the other thing that I want you to write 
is a bracket to the left of incubation period, illness, prodromal phase, and convalescence. And I want you to know that depending on the disease, you may be spreading the infection during all of those. So some illnesses you're spreading during the incubation period. Mumps is like that. You have no idea that you have mumps. You have no signs, no symptoms. You have no idea and you're spreading mumps to other people just by breathing during the course of the day. Um, others, they start spreading more towards the illness phase and the end, but you might be able to spread an illness during all four of those phases. Now, carriers, I mentioned typhoid Mary earlier. When you have a subclinical infection, you're said to be a carrier because you are carrying the infection from point A to point B and you're allowing it to spread, even though we really had no idea that you had that actual infection. These terms all mean the same thing here that they meant back in the viral stuff, but again, acute means you get sick, you get better, you move on with your life. Chronic means you get sick and you stay sick for a long period of time. Latent means you get sick, you get better, but you're still carrying it and it can come back a little bit later on. Now, this picture also relates it to the terms from just a second ago. So for an acute infection, you go through the incubation period. The prodromal phase would be right towards the end of that. Then you're actively ill, then you convalesce, then you get better. During a chronic infection, you have your incubation period with the prodromal phase going on right here. And then you're just ill for what seems like forever, I'm sure. Latent infection, you go through your incubation period, your illness, you convalesce. Then you're latent and you don't know that you still have it, but then the illness can recur later on. Next up, localized infection. This would be like a boil or a carbuncle, or if you have a cyst that has gotten inflamed, that's a localized infection. It means it's staying in one place, it's not moving to other areas of the body, and your body is in fact working really hard through inflammatory mechanisms to keep that infection localized and not allow it to spread to other places. Systemic infections are much more serious. This means bacteria is everywhere in your body and it can be affecting multiple body systems like your nervous system and your kidneys all at the same time. Um, bacteremia, now anytime you see a word that ends in emia, it means traveling through the bloodstream. So bacteremia means bacteria is traveling through the bloodstream. Now this picture is not normal healthy heart valve, but this is one of the semilunar valves of the heart. And this one, all of this plaque that's on the surface of that um, little, I'll call it a cusp, why not? Um, that's bacterial growth and fibrous tissue that has developed because bacteria was circulating and it seeded onto the heart valve and then it started to grow on that valve and it made the valve non-functional. Um, I am not sure if this patient was alive in that, but if they were still alive, they're gonna need a valve replacement and then some antibiotics to clear that bacterial infection. Now, there are some people who are known to be at higher risk for developing bacteremia. And when they go into the dentist prior to a cleaning, they are supposed to be put on antibiotics prophylactically to prevent exactly this from happening. And so those people in theory should know who they are. Next, so keeping in mind what emia means, toxemia means toxins are circulating through the bloodstream. Viremia is viruses are circulating through the bloodstream. Um, now this picture is showing you We've talked a little bit about Vibrios in the past. Vibrio fisheri was that glowy, glowy organism that could quorum sense. This one is a different Vibrio species. Um, what happens is when there is a bloom of Vibrio species, oysters and mussels and clams and things like that, they like to filter feed the water. And unfortunately what that means is the oysters will accumulate lots of Vibrio in their tissue. If you then eat that oyster, you just ate a lot of Vibrio bacteria and the toxins that those bacteria can produce can start circulating in your body. And then this is causing, again, that flesh eating thing. This is because of a toxin that's circulating that the Vibrio species could produce. And so this is an example of toxemia. Uh, what are Koch's postulates? I kind of described them earlier. You can get these four steps from the picture in your book. And since I already described them earlier, I'm just gonna skip right past that and go to, can you use his postulates for any disease? No, you cannot. One, some organisms can't be cultured. Um, so some organisms, they're what's known as fastidious. It means they have very specific nutrient requirements and we haven't figured out how to grow them in lab. There's just, we can't make it happen for some reason. And so for those organisms that we can't culture, we can't study them using Koch's postulates. Syphilis is one of those organisms. We can't grow it in the lab in a pure culture. Um, sometimes pathogens don't cause illness 
This can go back to infectious dose. It can go back to if we were using typhoid Mary as an example, if we were to inject her with the, um, it's Salmonella typhomerium is the species that causes typhoid fever, she wouldn't get sick from that because she has a subclinical infection and doesn't show any symptoms. Her immune system keeps it at bay. So it would have made it look like that bacterial species doesn't cause that infection because it never made her sick. She stayed perfectly fine during all of that. Um, sometimes populations of microbes can cause disease, so it takes a mixture of different organisms in order to actually be problematic. And then some diseases don't affect other species, and again, you can't test it on human beings. There's an ethics violation that happens when you do that. But if it doesn't affect mice or chimps or anything else, that means we can't study it in a lab to see if it's going to actually follow all of his postulates. Mm. All right. Uh, what are the pathogenic mechanisms that are described in the book? So number one, um, the organism produces a toxin and then you ingest the toxin. Now when we talked about botulism earlier, we were talking about it kind of in relation to honey and improper canning. It's not the bacteria itself that makes you sick. It's the bacteria grew inside of that can and produced a bunch of toxin and then you ate the toxin and the toxin got you sick. And so that's one of the ways that bacteria can make you sick is through the toxin that they secrete. Um, next, the bacteria can actually colonize, especially your mucous membranes, remember that's basically your entire digestive system and respiratory system, and then once they get onto that tissue, they start producing a toxin that makes you sick. Um, cholera is one of the organisms that's really good at that, and that's what we're looking at off over here. This is a cholera ward, they're hydrating them, but you drank some contaminated water the bacteria starts to grow inside of your intestines and then it produces a toxin that gives you the worst diarrhea of your life. Another example of one that can do this is that E. coli 0157H7. It gets into you, it starts making that Shiga toxin which makes you start bleeding out of various orifices. Mm. Um, invasion of host tissues. This is, it doesn't just stay on the mucous membranes, now it gets into organs like it's in your kidneys, it's in your liver, it's in your brain. Um, Yersinia pestis is the organism that causes plague. This unfortunate child was bitten by a flea and he got the plague and then the bite actually got infected and so he now has cutaneous plague. Um, so that's not just on a mucous membrane, we're down into muscle and connective tissue with that at this point and so he's, he's really suffering. Um, tuberculosis and salmonella can do that as well, just directly invade host tissues. Um, once they get into different host tissues, we can then start making toxins on top of that. That's like adding insult to injury. Not only did you have bacteria in places where you shouldn't have bacteria, but the bacteria that are there are making a toxin that makes you horribly sick. Um, this child has bacterial dysentery. Dysentery is another one of those diarrheal diseases where there is blood and pus in your urine because of the toxins being produced by the bacteria. She's using something similar to a life straw. It's got like some filters in it so that as she's drinking this, I'm sure contaminated water, it's hopefully get you, catching the bacteria so that the bacteria can't colonize you, invade deeper tissues, and then start to make that toxin. So she is trying to prevent exactly that from happening to her. Um, balance pathogenicity. What this essentially means is that most of the time pathogens don't actually want you dead because if they kill you, they just lost their house and they don't really want to do that. What they want to do is make you sick enough that you spread them and you give them additional housing opportunities available to them. One of the classic stories that relates to balanced pathogenicity has to do with rabbits in Australia. Rabbits in Australia are an invasive species. They were brought in by a dude who liked rabbit meat. Some of them escaped and then they just started mass producing rabbits all over Australia and out competing some of the native species, which Australians love their native species as a general rule. Um, so they, they hate rabbits there. They hate rabbits probably about as much as we hate fire ants here in Texas. It's the same sort of thing. They tried lots of things to control their rabbit population. They built fences, they poisoned them, they just flat out sent everybody out with rifles and was like, kill as many rabbits as you can. But one of the more interesting things that they did is they found a virus that infects rabbits, and only rabbits, this is, um, it's a type of biological control is what they were trying to do. It's called the myxoma virus. They introduced it. Now that virus is usually lethal to rabbits. And once we released it into Australia, at first it did a fantastic job and it killed a bunch of rabbits. But then what happened is 
the virus became less lethal and the rabbits developed more immunity to it so it stopped killing rabbits over time. That's what balanced pathogenicity is. The illness becomes less virulent and the host's immune system becomes stronger against that virus. One of the things, and this is going to be a very long-term thing, it is not going to happen super quickly probably, but one of the things that we are hoping for with um, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that is causing COVID-19, is that eventually it, we develop more into a balanced pathogenicity where it's not making people as ill as it currently is, but we still get some immunity to it if we get an infection. Um, adherence. So kind of like with a virus, the first thing that a bacterium has to do in order to infect a host is it has to attach to receptors present on that host. That's called adherence. If we can't attach to receptors, we can't actually colonize the host, which means we can't do any of the other illness stuff that gets associated with them. Colonization we really already defined, but again, it means the bacteria moved in. And again, they have to adhere first. If they can adhere to a receptor, then they can go ahead and colonize that host. Sometimes we will get biofilms that develop with multiple species in one area. Again, microbiota is really good at biofilm formation. What usually must be present for a bacteria to penetrate skin? A wound. Your skin is a very good surface barrier and most bacteria cannot penetrate intact skin, but you do get little wounds all day, every day without knowing it. Like yesterday, I was bitten by a fire ant. Well, that does generate a wound on my skin that in theory some bacterial species could move in and cause a localized infection that could then develop into systemic except I tend to wash my wounds and so not a big deal. You could cut yourself while shaving. I have no idea what this person did to generate that wound right there, but you do get wounds all the time. Um, explain how directed uptake by cells in a mucous membrane works. Essentially, sometimes a bacteria will trick one of your mucosal cells into inviting the bacteria in. That's what's happening in this electromicrograph. So these big poofy cells are some intestinal cells. And then the bacteria have triggered ruffling so that the host cell is actually inviting the bacteria in and then that bacteria is going to cause infection in those cells. Uh, what are some of the methods that a microbe can use to avoid destruction by phagocytes is what you have next. So essentially this is, you've been colonized, what can the bacteria do to prevent your immune system from killing them? Number one, run away essentially. If you never meet a phagocyte, a phagocyte cannot eat you. And so anytime we're preventing encounters, whether it is full on just running away from the bacteria or it's adding something like a slime coat or a capsule so that the phagocyte can't see the bacteria, that's kind of like hiding, that's preventing the encounter so you can't be eaten. Um, Avoid recognition and attachment is what you have next. This does go back to you can have a capsule on the outside surface that covers your antigens if you have a capsule so it makes it more difficult for the immune system to attack it. Um, your book also mentions M proteins and FC receptors. This just again makes it difficult for your phagocyte to actually attack the bacterial cell because it, it kind of changes the shape of the receptors so the antigens end up looking different and then your body doesn't recognize that as a foreign cell. Uh, three, surviving within the phagocyte. So this is, oh crap, I got eaten, but I'm just going to live inside the cell that ate me for an extended period of time. Usually this means you have some enzymes that can help you deal with the enzymes being produced by the phagocyte. You can also have some pH um, messer withers, which is not a term at all, but whatever. Um, so the bacteria can have ways to change the pH within the phagolysosome so that it doesn't get digested by any acids that get produced as they're in there. And so this is just literally living inside what ate you. Um, let's see, pretty much already said that stuff. Next up, different kinds of toxins is what we're going to talk about next. Exotoxins are toxins that are secreted by a cell. That is in contrast to an endotoxin, which we talked about previously. The endotoxin is actually part of the cell. The cell doesn't release it, it's part of the cell, but an exotoxin is something that the cell releases. Toxoids are inactivated toxins that we use in vaccines. So I mentioned tetanus earlier. The tetanus vaccine isn't exposing you to like dead tetanus bacteria. Instead, what it's exposing you to is inactive toxin because the toxin is the problem in a tetanus infection. And so we have to basically expose your immune system to that toxin so that it can fight it off if you get exposed to that toxin by stepping on something that you shouldn't have stepped on, most likely. 
Antitoxins work differently. Instead of being an inactivated toxin, it's an antibody to a toxin. So think of an antitoxin as an antibody to a toxin. Um, the story that I usually like to explain for this one, so this person, I think that's a cobra. It's always hard to tell when their hood's not out for me. Um, but he's milking this cobra to collect some venom from it. What they'll do with that venom is inject it into a horse because horses can make antibodies against that toxin. And then once we have that antibody in the horse, we can do plasmapheresis to get the antibody out. And then that's what antivenom is. So antivenom is an antitoxin, not a toxoid. They work differently because they're made out of different stuff. Um, from there, there's different kinds of toxins and the prefix always tells you exactly what they're going to attack. So a neurotoxin attacks the nervous system, which I think cobra venom does attack the nervous system. In Texas, the only snake that we have that attacks the nervous system is the coral snake, that whole red on yellow killifello snake. Um, enterotoxins or enterotoxins, I don't care which way you want to say that, but remember entero means gut and so they're going to cause things like diarrhea and vomiting, an enterotoxin will. Cytotoxin means cellular toxin. That's a toxin that directly kills cells. A to B toxins just have a complicated anatomy to them. Basically, it's a toxin that has two parts, an A part and then a B part. The A part is the part that's actually toxic, but the B part is what helps it bind to a receptor on a cell so that we can directly expose your cell to the toxic part. This makes toxins more species specific because they have to attach to a receptor first. Uh, hemolysins break down blood cells like we had talked about, beta, alpha, and gamma hemolysis. In beta hemolysis, hemolysins completely break down red blood cells. Um, endotoxin is again that lipopolysaccharide on the external surface of gram-negative cells. Again, it's not secreted, it's actually part of the cell, but your immune system very much dislikes endotoxin. Um, if endotoxin gets present in the bloodstream, it can cause septic shock. Um, now, anytime you see shock in relation to human uh, disease states, what it means is your blood pressure has dropped so much that you're not getting blood to all the areas of the body. That can be fatal. It shuts the kidneys down and it kills brain cells. And so septic shock means your blood pressure has dropped due to an overwhelming bacterial infection that is in the bloodstream and traveling through the bloodstream. It causes massive inflammation over the entire body, not localized, but everywhere. Um, it makes the blood vessels very permeable. And so what that means is the blood cells and the plasma are gonna leak out. And that's why you end up with what looks like blood everywhere all over the body. It's because the blood's not staying in the blood vessels. It's leaking out and it's everywhere. Once the blood leaks out, we start to coagulate that blood. That can lead to DIC, which is disseminated intravascular coagulation which essentially means all of your blood everywhere has clotted and that almost always means death if we get to that point. It's very difficult to treat that. Um, let's see, this particular, this is a one-year-old male, hope you could tell that. Um, he got septic shock from a, a meningitis infection. It was a meningococcal disease. He did recover from his, uh, from his septic shock. So again, I don't want to tell you everybody's going to die that gets septic shock. However, if it develops, chances are fairly high that the person is going to die from that. And so this needs immediate treatment right away and not just to help regulate the blood pressure, but that's part of it. But we also have to kill off the infection that's causing the problem overall. Um, what does the horseshoe crab do for us in microbiology? Seems like we take a left turn here, but actually we don't. Um, I do have a video that I always want to show you in relation to this. Horseshoe crabs are amazing for a whole bunch of different reasons. but First off, I want you to know that their genus name is Limulus, and the reason I want you to know that is we have the Limulus test that is created by the blood of the horseshoe crab, which is why it's called the Limulus test. Their blood is not like our blood. They use copper as their binding site for oxygen, so their blood is blue. It is the freakiest looking stuff ever. They have white blood cells, just like we have white blood cells, although theirs are different from ours. Um, whenever their white blood cells contact endotoxin, they change shape. And so what happens is we can use their blood to test whether or not there is endotoxin present on anything. What you have to realize is since endotoxin is part of a cell, it doesn't even take a live cell. If there is a dead cell present, there's still endotoxin present. And so we can use their blood to test for that. And then I just kind of wanted to show you how awesome they are. So here's this video. Mm.
us realize just how valuable the horseshoe crab is. When I first started 37 years ago, we were allowed to harvest them. There was no uh, recording, there was nothing. And they became fair game, and I was involved with selling them for bait. And then a doctor came down, and he said that if I didn't sell bait crabs anymore, he would be interested in the laboratory. Normal fishing is, you know, you catch it, you ice it, and you deliver it to the table, and you eat it. The horseshoe crabs, we actually catch them, take them to the lab, and they bleed them, then we bring them back and release them. So we're borrowing the crabs is really what we're doing. Crabs that are borrowed end up a couple of hours away at the Endosafe Laboratories in Charleston. Here in this alien world, they're given a rigorous cleaning to prep them for the process ahead. For the past 30 years, the biomedical industry has been mining the medical equivalent of gold. Endosafe is one of only four labs in the world that produces a derivative of horseshoe crab blood. Their blood has a clotting agent that's used to detect minute levels of bacteria. But what's truly surprising is the color. The crab's blue blood is an evolutionary gift that's helped them survive the eons. Dr. Norman Wainwright has been working with horseshoe crabs for most of his career, studying the remarkable properties of their blood. The beautiful blue color is a result of its blood containing copper as an oxygen-carrying pigment instead of hemoglobin, which contains iron. I'm adding a suspension of E. coli bacteria. At the first sign of bacteria, the crab's blood forms a protective clot. Look at that. This is, this is perfect. This is the butcher crab cells protecting the animal from infection. Any type of leakage of seawater into their blood system would trigger this response, seal the wound, and there actually are proteins in the clot itself that kill the bacteria. They're almost the primitive antibiotics. The phenomenon caught the attention. All right, so that was horseshoe crabs. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of respect for those lovely little critters. Mm. Um, after that, I gave you two model organisms to study, Bifidobacterium animalis. Oh, nuts, I didn't close something. Hold on. During the warmer... Close. Okay, there we go. Um, is this organism usually a pathogen? No, it's part of your normal flora. It is considered to be a probiotic. What is a probiotic? Well, it's bacteria that is considered to be good for you. And ordinarily that means it's part of your normal flora. Again, it's out competing pathogens, it's making you vital nutrients, it's priming your immune system, it's all good. Uh, what is the gram reaction of this species? It's positive. Um, so, Activia yogurt has uh, gotten into some trouble with some scientists for a bunch of different reasons. First off, they decided to try to rename Bifidobacterium animalis to this so that people would be more likely to like the bacterium or whatever, but their species is the same as this. They tried to patent it. Um, a lot of scientists have a problem with patenting living organisms in their natural state, but Activia tried to do that. But this is the species that you can find in some yogurts that they claim to be, make you more regular and things, and so it's a probiotic is the moral of that story. Uh, Canada albicans. Which domain does it belong to? It is a eukaryote, so these are their cells. You can see their nice little nuclei inside of there. Uh, what kingdom does it belong to? It is a fungus. Uh, specifically, it's a yeast. What is the name of the infection that this causes? Um, collectively, they're all called candidiasis, but they're called different things in different places. So this person has thrush. It is candidiasis in the mouth. This is a very common side effect of people receiving oral antibiotics. Um, what will happen is the antibiotics, especially if they're broad spectrum, it kills off a lot of the species of bacteria in the mouth. And then Canada's like, sweet, there's all these new apartments open up for me. And so it moves in and then you end up with a Canada infection, um, which is again called thrush in the mouth. Um, if it's in the vagina, it's usually just called the yeast infection. Diaper rash in babies is usually caused by an overgrowth of Canada as well. So candidiasis can cause lots of problems in lots of places. Um, this organism is part of the normal microbiota, so what can make it be pathogenic? 
almost always it's the bacteria that you had living in a certain place got wiped out somehow, usually through antibiotics. And so Canada took that opportunity and it started to overgrow. So again, this is one of the most common side effects of antibiotics is the person then gets a secondary yeast infection that resulted from the antibiotic killing off that bacteria. It's something that you've got to be on the lookout for if you're per um, ever prescribing to a patient any broad spectrum antibiotic, it makes this one more likely to happen. All right, so that concludes the illness chapter. Make sure you take the quiz that is posted in Schoology.